Thank you for that lovely introduction. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I also am um, quite honored by my center director and her kind words this morning. Um, we do work hard, and I, but I wanted to carve time out because I did not want to miss the opportunity to be here and share with you uh, what we've done with whole genome sequencing. Uh, it has been a paradigm change for food safety uh, traceability and I'm happy to do that and to tell you more about that. Um, so with that, I also think that Dr. Main thinks I might be stalking her because every time she speaks in the morning, I seem to slink along and speak in the afternoon. <laughs> but it's just a coincidence. I have to make sure you tell her that for me. So, oh, she's here. <laughs> oh, there she is. Oh, wonderful. Now I'm extra nervous. All right. So, thank you. So, uh, so anyway, thank you. I, I actually broke my presentation down today in, in, into three parts. Uh, one of those is really to let you know how we've brought the technology to where we are today. Uh, many of the changes from where we were uh, for the last 20 years in using subtyping tools and traceability tools to uh, bringing in whole genome sequencing and what that's done. Uh, it took a lot of work to validate. It took a lot of work to make ready for prime time. And I'll share that with you. Uh, the second thing I'd like to tell you about today is, is where we are in terms of the development of a global database. Because, because of the power of traceback that we now have. So, so the genome tracker is that database. And I'll share with you the state of the art of where that stands and what kind of difference it is already making as we do regulatory science in microbiological safety. Finally, I'll end with just that and show you some examples of where whole genome sequencing is being applied in real time to make a real difference, uh, ultimately, which will prevent foodborne illness. It has prevented foodborne illness, uh, and we believe ultimately will save lives. So we're delighted to share this with you. Many of you are familiar with the way um, things have been done for the last 20 years. Uh, when we study Salmonella or E. coli or Listeria, we have to serotype that strain, and so we use classical antigen typing tools. Many of you are familiar with PFGE through the PulseNet network and how for many years that has been a staple, uh, a staple for how we typed and traced pathogens uh, as well as we could. One of the things about PFGE you'll notice, and this is an actual PFGE gel, is that um, you only have a few fragments. It cuts all the DNA from a bacteria into a few fragments. And sometimes that fragment pattern is informative and can tell you about the relationship to an outbreak strain, and other times it may not be. And so uh, what I'm going to tell you about is how we were able to fill the space in between with this new technology, which relies not on fragments or, or on gel electrophoresis, but relies on mutations. Single nucleotide polymorphisms, you'll hear me say the word SNP quite a bit if you're not familiar with it. A SNP is simply a genetic mutation that separates me from you or one E. coli strain from another E. coli strain. Um, and the more closely related you are, the fewer mutations you have differentiating you, the more evolutionarily similar you are. And it's just like a family tree. And so, um, as you can see, one of the great advantages of whole genome sequencing has been that we have three to five million data points now to collect for every strain that we analyze. And for the case of Salmonella, it's 4.6 million. And when you have that many points of data to, to base your assessment of relatedness on, you actually can start to reach the asymptote of truth and accuracy in a molecular discriminatory method. And that's what we've begun to see. That's why source tracking is one of the most powerful applications of whole genome sequencing because it can take you back to a source not only at an at a unprecedented level of discrimination but it can do so in a way that is um, absolutely accurate in terms of your hypothesis and what you're trying to find the source. So the other good news is that when you go side by side in time and labor efforts next generation lab response which involves whole genome sequencing is comparable right now in the amount of time it takes uh, to conventional lab response. That's very exciting. It's also uh, comparable in price. Uh, when we did the first genome in late 2008, uh, it was actually about $700 per genome for a bacterium to be sequenced in our laboratory using 454 technology. As you can see, over the last few years, the price has dropped precipitously 
Right now, if we load the machines upstairs on the fourth floor completely, we are running at about $40 to $42 per genome. That is as cheap as a pulse field gel electrophoresis run uh, and is quite exciting as the price continues to drop. Uh, we didn't get, at the FDA, we didn't bring whole genome sequencing to the laboratory knowing that we were about to shift the paradigm in, ty in typeability and traceability. We brought whole genome sequencing for the reason that we needed better diagnostic markers. We needed more than just NVE for Salmonella or STX1 and STX2 for Shigatoxin E. coli. We knew there were other things in the genome that would be highly informative. That's why we brought whole genome sequencing to support our methods development program. It was only by circumstance that we actually found out that it works so well for traceback and traceability. And this was actually a, what one might frame, a perfect storm kind of outbreak. In early 2009, there was a spice salami plant in New England that uh, was contaminated with Salmonella montevideo. It had made a number of people sick. It was a fairly large outbreak. The issue, though, uh, surrounding it was quite difficult. It turned out that many of the ingredients that go into this salami also had a recent Salmonella Montevideo outbreak or contamination the year before. So you had numerous ingredients, even from those vendors or those suppliers where it was found, coming together in a finished product on another part of the country. Uh, unfortunately, when using PFGE, the first three enzymes gave the exact same pattern for every isolate, whether it be clinical or environmental. So we couldn't figure out using PFG, we couldn't get any leads on what the source might be. Ultimately, we ended up trying six different enzymes. Some worked, but they weren't concordant with what we knew about the epidemiology. Uh, so when we looked at the tree, the important thing that you see here is not that you read this, but only to see that pistachios, which were part of the spice salami, were not part of the outbreak. They were exonerated even though they could have been guilty. We didn't know at the time they had the Salmonella Montevideo that matched the outbreak. We found out by, it was like, for whole genome sequencing when we first used this, it was like turning on the Hubble telescope. Must have fell to an astronomer. When you look, we looked into an outbreak, all of a sudden it resolved. And that was extraordinary. And so pistachios were free, the cheeses were free. Um, we found out that somebody got sick at the same time that wasn't even related to the outbreak. They ate an unrelated salami product in another part of the country. Uh, we linked it back to the facility and the culprit in this case was actually the red and black pepper that went into the salami. And we were able to go back and look at that and confirm by getting isolates out of the red and black pepper that that was the case. And we actually got a chance to go back and look at the PFG patterns and we found out that the last three enzymes did not correlate at all with relatedness. So we knew that we had to use this tool in cases like this, particularly for salmonella, where you get this difficult homogeneity that's hard to break open. Uh, in one case, when we had this individual patient who didn't match up with the other patients, we went back and looked at the isolate from that individual and found out that the reason it didn't match up is because it shouldn't have there were at least 40 different genes in the salmonella that made that individual sick that were separate and distinct from the New England illnesses uh, that were in the major cluster. So you could go back into the genome, you could find out why it was different. And in this case, what I love about whole genome sequencing is that it's not almost or sort of or right there outside, it's either you're in or you're out. And it's really wonderful to have that kind of robust confidence in the data. Uh, right away, we realized it was time to kick the tires, take this for a spin. We got many, many questions right away about stability, variation, uh, what defines sameness, and these were all very good questions. And so we began to investigate the technical performance. We actually took isolates of salmonella from an individual salami that made someone sick in Iowa. We took the isolate from the person in Iowa. We followed the isolate from the salami through the individual, sequenced it right out the back, sequenced it into the laboratory, took multiple colonies of the same isolate, multiple DNAs of the same colony, and multiple genomes of the same DNA. And we learned about the inherent stability of whole genome sequencing. There was a concern. 
Is the bug in the same as the bug out? Now with this kind of resolution, the question is valid. And the answer is, I'm happy to say, that salmonella is quite stable. It's already highly adapted in the foods that it occupies, and uh, the bug out has always been the bug in so far in the last six years. So uh, we were able to look at that. We found out that there was inherent stability in the genome sequences. You could follow the lunch meat to the, end, to the, to the isolate that made the patient sick. You could follow the colony passages in the lab. They all held up quite stable. And if there was overnight variation, we found out you could generate one or two SNP differences by growing a culture overnight. It's to be expected out of 4.6 million. And in doing so, though, it always stays within its group. It doesn't automatically shoot it out of the tree somewhere over here. It stays with its home group, and it just puts these small little nicks right here in the tree. So very good news. It's been very stable as we move forward with it. We validated our analytical pipeline. There's a huge bioinformatic pipeline that supports our program. That's validated, that's fully public and available on the internet uh, at github.com where bioinformaticists can take our same data that we used, put it through our pipeline, and make sure that it says what it's supposed to say. We learned how to structure investigations properly. We learned what reference isolates are important. Are they event related? Are they the same matching PFGE but not related by epidemiology? And then are they different? So we learned how to set up reference inclusivity to make sure that we're rooting our trees properly and getting the most inference out of them that we can. I will show you now two examples as we moved forward that happened to arise that really opened our eyes to the power of the technology. As you know, there were two fairly large peanut butter outbreaks in the last decade. One in 2007, one in 2009. Uh, both of them involve Salmonella Tennessee, which is a very heat stable um, Salmonella cerevar, group one Salmonella, very virulent to humans. Uh, and it, these outbreaks did cause a number of illnesses. Uh, in the second case, even worse. Uh, and so we were assisting the Office of Criminal Investigations, who had to deal with this two year window of two separate peanut butter outbreaks because there were illnesses that fell in between those years. There were illnesses that fell much earlier than those years. And because again of this conserved PFGE allele, they were unable to determine whether they were the same, whether they were part of the event or not part of the event. We were able to look at these isolates um, and actually support OCI because you can see it's the distribution and traceability of peanuts, tomatoes, and other products like this is often quite difficult. And so having this tool really does help overcome some of the complexities that we face when we're in the business of tracing back through bills of lading, distributors, repackers, and things of that nature. So it has been really helpful. In this case, I want to show you the resultant tree that we helped OCI with, and that is the orange is supposed to represent the actual peanut butter isolates. The green are actually from, from the facilities themselves that were sampled, and the reds are from patients who were sickened by isolates. Uh, very quickly, you could see a link could be made between the facility, the product, the finished product, and the clinical cases that were caused uh, by it. Uh, in the second event in 2009, we also had a food isolate, and we had clinical cases here. What was interesting, we knew this, this could, it could do this, what was interesting in this case is that you could actually look back in time and link isolates from as early from illnesses at 2004 that were indistinguishable by whole genome sequencing from the finished product in 2007. That meant that there was low level sporadic leakage into the food supply as early as three years prior. Uh, related to illnesses associated with that event when it finally did break open in 2007. Same way with the 2009 event. We had illnesses go all the way back to 2006 and 2007 that linked to that event. If we hadn't had the technology, we would have assumed that the 2007 isolate would have gone with the 2007 outbreak, but in fact it didn't. It was linked more to the 2009, showing that in that case also there was leakage early on, prior to the large event. Uh, one of the game-changing events, what I like to call a transforming event, for us was in 2012 when we endured a large sushi outbreak from Salmonella borreli. 
Uh, Salmonella borreli is also very hot. It's a type 1 salmonella. It's very virulent to humans. Uh, in this case, it was associated with Nakaochi tuna scrape, which is the main ingredient in spicy tuna. Uh, it was a large outbreak along the East Coast, primarily centralized in the Mid-Atlantic, right here, where we had the greatest number of illnesses. I think that just attests to the great number of sushi lovers here in the Washington area, <laughs> including myself. Uh, in fact, um, one of these isolates from Maryland is actually mine. I actually got Salmonella borreli. <laughs> Uh, because I could not curb my own consumption of sushi during the contamination event, so, uh, which was good. It was a good internal control. So, uh, so it turned out that, uh, unfortunately, they all had the same PFG, as expected. And so this was a problem because it linked back to not only tuna suppliers, it linked back to other seafood suppliers all around the Pacific Rim. And we have 1,400 inspectors. We can't send them across the Pacific Rim looking for spicy tuna, all of them. So um, this tool shows great value in now being able to look across the globe and try to trace back to regions where we can focus our efforts. Uh, it turned out first that when we took the illnesses by whole genome sequencing, you could distinguish them from these other seafood supply isolates, as you can see right here. This is the illness cluster. These are the historic seafood isolates, and then when we added the actual isolates, including my own, to the tree, you can see that the isolates from the food and from the illnesses matched indistinguishable across 4.6 million data points, uh, showing that in essence, it's almost a genomic coax postulates, that we're able to confirm the food matched the clinical cases, uh, and when we, we noticed that the product in the laboratory that this came from was from Moon Fisheries, which is where the epi had led us back and the traceability had led us back to, so it was a nice validation. Uh, one good thing we saw that was, and this is the thing that kind of started the whole genome tracker revolution, was that there was a single isolate from shrimp that was collected by one of our inspectors at the Port of Irvine, where seafood had come in through the Pacific Rim. And one of those shrimp isolates right here was only about 20 snips away from the outbreak and separate from all the other Pacific Rim isolates that were in our database. That isolate, as it turned out, when we mapped it onto the globe, could have come from any one of these places you see a red star. Any one of those places had a matching PFG of a Salmonella borreli from, from seafood, but where the yellow arrow is points to where that shrimp isolate also was localized to. That isolate was actually six miles away from the Moon Fisheries plant in one of the shrimp processing distributors literally just up the road, suggesting that there is phylogeographic structure in Salmonella and whole genome sequencing will find it every time. When we map that data onto Google Earth, you could see that there were multiple events coming out of the Moon Fisheries facility in Southwest India, hitting the East Coast primarily in New York and Washington, which is why we got the bulk of the illnesses right here between these two points. You could see that that lone shrimp isolate also made its way to the East Coast, uh, where it was also again collected. And the good news is, is that um, if we'd had this in place in real time in 2012, we could have saved ourselves a lot of trouble because we would have known this was the, where we needed to send everybody and start looking. And so thus was born out of this epiphany, if you will, the genome tracker database because we realized that if we had a large database of genome sequences that represented the phylogeographic variation of salmonella and other pathogens around the world, I said that all in one breath, <laughs> we could trace back very quickly. And so we started the database uh, and the database of course has three components. It requires labs, a distributed model for laboratories to generate data, it requires management of the data flow, bioinformatic network management, and it requires a place to curate, access, and retrieve all of those genomes. Now that's not an easy thing to do, because you know a genome is a lot of information on your computer. So we partnered with NCBI, because NCBI takes the challenge of facing these, particularly the economic challenges, and takes the place of one of them. At NCBI's at the National Institutes of Health, 
They curate the Human Genome Project, all of the genomes that we sequence and submit and upload, whether we're in government, academia, or industry. NCBI has really jumped onto the project. They think this is one of the most applied public health projects they've ever been part of, and they're very excited. And they store data. They move, they move nearly a petabyte of information in and out of their facility every day. Um, we're talking about, you know, who has that ability to store that much information in their local shop? Keeping in mind that five petabytes is the equivalent in space of every word ever written or ever spoken since the dawn of time. So we're talking about a lot of information here moving in and out. And so because NCBI helps us and they got involved, we now have more money to generate more sequences, to expand the network, and to do more analyses in real time. And so the strategy has, of course, been to develop a distributed model. The distributed model works great because it means that you have multiple machines running in parallel around the country providing data. Um, our partnership with NCBI has been huge. Our partnership with the CDC, who's also come on board and is now using whole genome sequencing and listeria surveillance in real time. And uh, so this has been a very positive move. The model is here. The model is basically set up so that the genome tracker laboratories will flow whole genome sequence data for enteric pathogens into the NCBI curation site in Bethesda, Maryland. From there, it's completely publicly accessible. The data can then be pulled back to FDA, to CDC, to USDA, and any other regulatory point or investigative point. It can also be used for things that you might not even imagine. It will provide and drive innovation because there are now more than 25,000 genomes of salmonella readily available for academia, for industry, and things of that nature. So it's, um, it's moving forward. Now, we don't put everything in the database. So we don't, obviously, you don't put the name of a company. You don't put things like that in a database. You just put the salmonella. You put the date, the relative region it came from. And that kind of information is enough to provide leads on a global level, and if we need more, um, we'll contact our colleagues and talk about it behind the blue curtain if we need more. So in the meantime, uh, here's our map of what the genome tracker looks like. We've got uh, nearly 20 states now involved where they have sequencing technology up and running, flowing data in real time. We also have all 10 of our regional FDA field laboratories sequencing all of their inspectional isolates in real time which is very helpful. All the CDC is also doing listeria in real time and uploading that to the database. They're also getting ready to start E. coli, to my knowledge. And so we have, and we have international partners. Um, we have the United Kingdom, which is participating, uploading a lot of data. Argentina has been our first pilot with the World Health Organization, which is going very well, and Alaska and Hawaii. Both of, uh, may have been last to enter the union, but first to get sequencers, so, which is very exciting. Uh, the salmonella in the database is growing exponentially. You can see it's moving uh, quite extraordinarily. We're up now just to in-country uploads, more than 12,000 uh, in the database right now. I'm happy to report that Public Health England uploaded another 12,000 this past month, doubling effectively the size of our database. And our Listeria database is now close to 5,000. This slide is clearly out of date by a couple of months. And uh, so it's moving quickly. These salmonella are really very geographically and phenotypically. Uh, we have, um, well, this show, actually, I apologize. This shows you actually just how many, where we stand. We also have, in addition to salmonella and listeria, a lot of pathogenic E. coli, Chronobacter sakazaki, Campylobacter jejunii, and Vibrio parahemolyticus. And we can open up any new bio project to include any other pathogen that becomes of concern as we move forward. Right now, for example, the salmonella, this is the slide I thought I had next, uh, represents salmonella from 65 countries, 45 states, all five diverged sublineages of salmonella, including the reptilian lineages are represented. 400 serovars from group one salmonella are in the database, including the top 100 that affect people. And uh, I'm happy to say that the, temporally, it spans more than 25 years of collecting of salmonella. Um, old isolates are good too. They're important. Uh, I'm happy also to report that the medicine that goes up with these isolates is enough
that we can learn what we want to know about them, including uh, the geographic location, the collection date, who to contact if we need more information, and more about the salmonella itself. We don't violate patient privacy, and we certainly wouldn't violate industry privacy. So uh, it's a very straightforward minimal metadata set. Uh, as you can see, the metadata for location is important. It's one of the key things we focus in on, but going any further than that is all behind the blue curtain, so there's no violation of any of the sharing, the spirit of sharing or collaboration, which is good news. Now, I will give you some examples of where, since this has been established, it's actually made a difference in real regulatory action. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the risk now associated with certain Latin-style cheeses with listeria. In this case, in the spring of 2014, we had a situation again here in the Mid-Atlantic where a Latin-style cheese had caused a great number of illnesses in Maryland, Virginia, and the area. Uh, when we combined those isolates with the CDC's clinical genomes, we found out that, in fact, you could link back the food isolates, the facility isolates, and the clinical isolates all to a very tightly linked cluster less than five SNPs apart. And uh, so when we went back to the firm, we did again find it there, and we were honored that the commissioner, uh, Margaret Hamburg at the time, actually noted in her memo under her newfound powers in FISMA as she suspended the registration, she did note the use of whole genome sequencing as a novel tool, investigative tool, to help drive this forward. And so we were all very honored that the hard work that had been put in was actually being used now in real time uh, to, to do our job better, to protect public health and protect the American consumer. Um, in fact, if you look at it from a foodborne outbreak curve, FDA has been traditionally accustomed to getting involved on an outbreak curve like this somewhere over here. By the time a person gets sick, uh, the food enters commerce, it's contaminated, a person eats it, a person gets sick, a person reports to the doctor. The doctor must report to the state health department, which reports to the CDC, which does the clustering and confirms an outbreak. We're up here. CDC confirms to the FDA that there's traceability. We start our trace back, we're already here. And the food almost is already gone. And there's nothing left to trace back to. And so whole genome sequencing is now providing us the ability to intercede here. All of the agencies can intercede using the data in parallel in real time right here. And that's actually gonna be, that's the game changer for us. And uh, as an example, last summer, we had an example where because we do certain high focus uh, sampling, we found out that we had um, a tree nut linkage back to an illness, an isolate of Salmonella brandera from a tree nut facility that linked back to two random illnesses in the country of Salmonellosis. And at first, there's really not much to say. There's no outbreak by definition. Two doesn't necessarily comprise an outbreak. And so, but when we went back and looked at the database, it was very compelling. Those two illnesses were only two base pairs, two SNPs different from the inspectional isolates that our people in the Pacific Northwest collected from the tree nut firm. Two SNPs is the same. Because remember I told you that if you culture it overnight in the laboratory, you can expect one to two SNPs. This was, in essence, the identical strain. And so when we went back, inquired more about this, and asked, the CDC actually followed up with these illnesses and found out that they did eat the same peanut butter product. And um, that was eye-opening because then other states could come forward and say, well, we actually had people eat that too. And before you know it, it all came together into what turned out to be an event that we caught very early. And it all ended very well. Um, it, this is the difference for us. Before whole genome sequencing, if we had a nut butter outbreak as we did in fall 2012, before we had it up in real time, we had 42 cases, 10 hospitalizations, more than 1,200 illnesses. In the event last summer, we caught it with no more than four confirmed cases, one hospitalization, and just a handful of illnesses that didn't report out. So we believe we can actually affect um, saving lives using the technology, which is extraordinary. And think of the economic impact, both to industry and to the government, on being able to find these things earlier. So it doesn't just work well for salmonella. 
We've also, in our collaboration with the CDC in real time, we have actually found uh, a case of sprouts that were contaminated at a facility uh, using whole genome sequencing and looking at the regularly updated whole genome tree that comes out every 48 hours. We found one of our inspection isolates found out right, it fell out right in the middle of a number of clinical isolates um, showing that in fact there was a linkage between this firm and illness in the United States. When we went back and looked at the whole shooting match all in one run, we actually found out that there had been illness that had leaked out even as much as a year earlier that was related to the facility. So we're, we can easily define the scope. We can delimit the scope and define even in time and space the extent of the event. And that's what's been most gratifying. The current status of the genome tracker network, uh, we have more than 15 real-time examples that we're moving forward on that I can't talk about because they're right now happening. Uh, we have um, next generation sequencing as it's often called, I call it whole genome sequencing, gives us good location specificity and we're going to keep growing the database for that reason. More than 15,000 salmonella, 25 if you count Public Health England's contribution, 4,000 listeria. On average, our collaborating partners in the network are putting up one genome per hour. And uh, that is absolutely tremendous. It's going to help everyone involved. Uh, we are always looking for increased, well-characterized environmental and food isolates to add to the database with partners in academia and elsewhere. And our partnership with CDC has really been a success uh, moving forward on listeria outbreaks in real time. So we know there's a lot of questions. Very controversial when you shift to paradigm. Very controversial. Uh, who, how are we going to share all the data? Who owns the data? Is there IP associated with the data? We understand that in different countries, the answer to that question will be different. Who's going to pay for all this? Uh, it's, you know, it, it takes some money to keep this network up and going. Um, what about quality assurance? How can we make sure that if we partner with a certain country somewhere else in the world, that they wouldn't say, oh, I'm going to throw everybody off the trail of me. I'm just going to upload fictitious genomes that don't really mean anything. And so there has to be quality assurance. There has to be quality control, which we try to do regularly. But as the, as the network grows, so will that need. Uh, who provides oversight, coordination, and administration? And then the ever controversial question, how much metadata is enough metadata without crossing the line? And so the, we know that with every, every technology shift, with every paradigm change, these kinds of questions arise. We've been here before. Uh, 20 years ago we were here with PulseNet. And we'll, we'll get through it. And we'll get through it internationally. Uh, we've already had some great conversations with the World Health Organization. Uh, they're going to put this up in front of the World Health Assembly soon. It'll be good to reach out to that group. Um, and we meet all the time with stakeholders from around the country. FDA is using it. We're not just using it for traceback. We're actually using it for our own quality control, for our own micro-testing programs. It's making a huge difference. We can now know and make sure we don't have contaminants that we isolated from our own laboratories. We know that they're real or not. Uh, we're using it for the, our repeat offender projects, which are extremely helpful. Uh, we're also using it for one microbiology workflow. And that's very important because in the next five years, whole genome sequencing is going to basically come into a microbiology workflow like this, which involves at least five or six different tests, microbiological tests, microbiological technologies, and it's going to take over and replace all of those into one test, one analyte, and one workflow. Right now, we can get through the last two boxes of an investigation with a whole genome sequence. That includes antimicrobial resistance, virulence profiling, serotype, subtype, and that information. In the next five to seven years, it will definitely span even detection and hopefully directly out of foods, which is where we're headed. Right out of a food or environmental sample, we'll be able to characterize the entire genome of an enteric pathogen, along with lots of other things. So this is where we will be, hopefully, in the next five to seven years. So. I think I cut it close. I think I'm right in where I should be. I want to tell you, doing genomics is, a, is really a village. It's a village of effort. And it, no one can do it the way Hemingway said. You're definitely not an island in genomics. And so 
we have a lot of people to thank. The list would be so huge that I couldn't put it on one slide. So we actually put down large agency names and states to show you who's been involved up to this point. So uh, I, we certainly at FDA couldn't have done it by ourselves. It's required a huge effort. And if you're interested and you're in the D.C. area, I invite you on September 24th to join us at our first ever ASM-sponsored conference on whole genome sequencing, food safety, and molecular traceback of, of enteric pathogens. We're going to have speakers from all over the world. Our colleagues from the CDC will be here. Uh, at least 30 of the states will be represented. All of our genome tracker partners will be here. We actually just wanted to do a session at the next ASM meeting. So we wrote to do a session and ASM wrote back and said, this is of general interest and so hot right now that we'd like to provide you the resources to have a whole meeting. And we were like, fantastic, we accept. So, uh, so please make note of it and let us know. Please email me if you're interested and we'll get you set up. So thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> Uh, we do have uh, some time for questions. Simin Maidani Nutrition Center on Aging. I don't think, is this on? Yeah. So have you looked at then, given the presentation before by Dr. Ordovas, have you looked at how some of the genetic information related to the pathogens relates to the genetic uh, polymorphism in the host? That's a very good question. And that is the added benefit of genome sequencing. And one place where that is something we're trying to harvest as much of the low-hanging fruit that we can in that area is in Listeria. So we do have a program now to mine these data and actually see, are there specific clusters of listeria that represent more virulent lineages to human beings? Uh, are there specific clusters that colonize the food supply in a more high risk sort of way? And what does that mean in terms of the people who are getting sick? And so, uh, as uh, Dr. Main actually pointed out, we have had a large meeting recently of national experts to convene on this issue, just last week actually in Greenbelt, Maryland. And, uh, and so we are using the genome to at least see if anything is sticking out right away to do that. It's a very complex challenge and uh, one so much so that animal models, as you know, and many other approaches have not gotten us there. And so uh, we will keep using the genomics and wring as much information out of it as we can. One other thing related to that that we've learned is adaptations that we never knew existed. In Salmonella, for instance, in that tuna outbreak, we found that the Borrelli survives so well in tuna because uniquely, unlike any other salmonella, it has a cassette that gives it resistance to arsenic and heavy metals. And other salmonella can't do that. So we know it's adapting. We know that it's overcoming challenges in the food supply. And this has been eye-opening because now we can start to focus in on specific preventive controls to target those bugs in their most adapted fit habitats. Um, obviously ways that the host factors in terms of the pathogen can be determined and I think there's a lot of interesting things that could be done in relation to that. I, think. I agree and, and while we haven't been able to really delve deeply into the clinical side, um, those collaborations are invaluable and if, if you are willing to and know people who are engaged in that, we're always willing to share our genomes, the isolates and our expertise on the food side to address that problem. Thank you. Yes, hi. Th thank you, Eric. Brent Flickinger from ADM. I, I noticed that you uh, added the third phase, or your goal of adding the third phase of detection, or the third pillar or piece, um, over the next five or so years. And I'm, I'm presuming that includes environmental samples as well. Can, can you give any insight as to what the agency's thinking with regard to how they're going to handle environmental samples? Because many in the food industry obviously will have preventive controls and things like that to protect their item from the environment and therefore mm -hmm. not have it in the finished product. So I'm interested to see where the agency might be if you get an environmental sample that's of concern and how you might manage that from a, from a visit or a compliance. 
Well, uh, really, really, luckily for us, the director of my center is here and can take on difficult policy questions. So, <laughs> feel like I'm standing over a Burmese tiger trap here in Northwest DC. Maybe so you're actually, feeling like Tom Cruise in, uh, yeah. what was that movie where the little balls came so, yeah. down? You know, yeah, right. Minority, Minority Report. Report. So, so actually, um, while I know that, and I certainly cannot speak to it as I'm not qualified to speak about what FISMA will mean for environmental testing, I will say that what I can say is that the FDA, even as we move into a world where environmental <laughs> testing becomes more automatic, more metagenomic, more regular. Uh, we have always and plan on always getting our own samples. And so anything that we collect, of course, we'll bring back and that what we put through now in a, in a whole genome sequence pipeline will go through in a metagenomic uh, culture independent pipeline. That would be the vision. But those would be samples that we would collect. How we would interface with industry on a more FISMA based policy level I apologize that I can't speak to that, but I, I can certainly give you the names of those individuals who are qualified to well, do but so. If you could, I just want to, I think your question is right on. In, to answer this from a scientific standpoint, association is not causation, right? Right. That's true. That's, there so, has to be, I guess, I guess I think what you're getting at is, um, would we just move on a whole genome link or a whole genome lead? And I'm, I certainly, uh, just like the FBI certainly wouldn't move in a real criminal investigation with just a forensic piece of information without doing some shoe leather follow-up, we too believe that, as always, investigations of outbreaks are holistic. And they require great effort from not only the laboratory, but also from compliance and our core outbreak investigations who actually do the shoe leather. So I, 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 I asked you the question, it's a, your answer is great. I, I, I sit back and I look at this massive amount of data and what do we know about the, the actually the ecology of these strains and similarities, right? I, I, don't, I don't know that we've got our arms around that. Well, that's, yeah, so every day is a new learning experience, that's right. And now we didn't even know, you know, five years ago we didn't realize that there was structure around the globe on pockets of genotypes that live in certain places. So as the database grows, as we do more outbreaks, we are learning more about what it means to be sane, what it means to be different. We can predict with some confidence now, if we have representatives from a part of the world, what your salmonella might look like. And so it's coming along. But as it grows, there will always be room to improve. Absolutely. Hi. Hi. Okay, I feel like I should go to the short person microphone. Um, <laughs> hi, this is Liz Westering, General Mills, and uh, thank you. That was really, really interesting. And uh, as I listened, I thought there were a lot of analogies to like the Innocence Project and new DNA research and that kind of thing. Um, as you look retrospectively, could you just clarify if there are situations where um, PGFE or MVLA patterns um, now when you use whole genome sequencing that you come to a different conclusion than you might have with the older technologies? That's a good question. And I'm happy to say I have an answer, <laughs> unlike previous questions this, this morning. So. Um, Yes, uh, we, I'm ha no, most of the time, those techniques, while they may not have the resolution, often got you there as far as they could. It's not like they sent you off into another dimension away from the, the, the event. Now, having said that, we have run into cases where we have seen in the case of a Salmonella agona event in dry cereal, we saw three different PFGE patterns which would have suggested to us that there were three different point sources to that outbreak, to that event. When we went back and whole genome sequenced it, we found out that those differences were in large part only due to horizontal DNA floating around in plasmid form and had nothing to do with the actual relatedness of the strains. When we sequenced it, all three were almost identical. It was a single point source, and that was a case where earlier subtyping tools would have sent us down a, another path. That's a very good point. Can we attend one quick question? One more. Go. So I'll look back and make sure there's nobody behind me. Jimmy, <laughs> Jimmy Williams with McDonald's Corporation. So very good presentation. And Jimmy, so thank you. Believe me. 
<laughs> Thumbs up. So, a departure from where you, on, on the more scientific part, but my question in looking at this and being able to isolate, uh, especially with uh, FDA look back, is can you tell me a little bit more about the liability factor um, as you're able to narrow down the impacts of this and exactly what do you think those impacts are uh, being able to say this is exactly where the source of this you know, these illness are? Well, that's a, it's a very good question. I don't believe it changes anything that our Office of Compliance would do normally. All it does is it really strengthens the confidence that they can have in uh, admissibility, inclusivity, exclusivity. And so for all of the great companies, many of which I know comprise right here in this room, uh, you keep doing what you're doing. You do a great job every day. And, and, and won't it be nice for those companies who do a great job, which is the majority, the vast majority of all of you doing this here for, and putting food in the food supply, won't it be nice to have a tool where you don't actually get brought into in a first clustering, uh, oh, well, now we've got to go talk to this company and this company and this company. Right away, we will know, oh, McDonald's had nothing, to, they're, they're not part of this. You can see they're not in this. And so please keep in mind that with increased and enhanced resolution comes the enhanced and increased exoneration of those who might not have been easily exonerated using more nebulous tools, typing tools. It goes both ways. Okay. Very good.